Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. Today is the 28th of September 2016 and I'm delighted once again to welcome to the programme somebody who is uh, well known and greatly appreciated by listeners to TMR and uh, many other alternative media programmes, Dr Paul Craig Roberts, whose career spanned academia, journalism, business, public service, many senior academic positions in universities, associate editor and columnist for the Wall Street Journal, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy during Reagan's first term in office, and then a consultant to the U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of Commerce. Dr. Roberts, thank you once again for joining us on the show. Well, Julian, it's always pleasant to speak with you. It's always a privilege to be able to speak with you, Dr. Roberts. So we're going to be talking today about the ongoing situation in Syria and the prospects for war as you see them. And I'm I'm responding here really to a short article that you posted last week at paulcraigroberts.org, which you called, quote, finally, the Russians have caught on that negotiation with Washington is pointless, end quote. And in that, you call for the people in the West to wake up to what our so-called leaders are doing, lest there be a, well, a third world war. And you draw specific attention to an article that analyzes the words of Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov at a recent meeting of the UN Security Council, and which he basically says that the so-called ceasefire agreements are now pretty much off the table for discussion. So I wanted to begin by asking you, why is Lavrov saying that they're off the table now? Well, um, there was the American attack on the Syrian army position, it was a known position. And so this was obviously not merely a violation of the ceasefire, but it was a new development. It was the first time the United States had itself directly attacked Syrian forces instead of using its jihadist forces, such as ISIL. So that was not only a violation, but it was an escalation of the conflict. It was a statement uh, by Washington to the Russians that Washington was now directly entering the conflict and that Russia in the future might actually face American forces, either in the air or on the ground. And then we had the uh, Turkish-U.S. invasion of northern Syria. So the country is now petitioned. And then today the news is that Kerry has delivered an ultimatum to Lavrov that unless uh, Russia stops the Syrians from their advancement in Aleppo, where they're finally clearing out the American-supported jihadist ISIL, the whole agreement is off and America will no longer cooperate with Russia and blah, blah. But of course, uh, Washington has never cooperated with Russia. So I don't really see the point of Kerry's ultimatum other than to set a firmer tone for war. And then we had today the faked report of the Malaysian airliner crash or being shot down. And the report ignores all the evidence supplied by Russia and concludes that the airliner was shot down by a missile system brought in from Russia and fired from rebel territory and then taken back to Russia, which is preposterous on its face. I mean, what does Russia have to gain from shooting down a Malaysian airliner? Has it got to do with anything? Russia. And certainly why send it in to shoot it down from rebel territory and then take it back to Russia? If Russia wants to shoot the damn thing down, they could shoot it down from Russian territory. Mm -hmm. It's an absurdity, Julian, but what it is, it's part of the preparation of the brainwashed and propagandized gullible people throughout the West for war with Russia because um, they're using obvious lies And they're setting Russia up on every front. So why would you do that? What is the purpose of these aggressive lies, this aggressive use of language, all the accusations and insinuations? The Russians know they're all false. And so what is the effect on the Russians? I'm talking about the Russian government. The effect on them is it looks like they're getting ready to attack us. 
Mm. It's a very dangerous situation. Absolutely. Do you think the hope in Washington is that Russia will essentially back down? I think that may be part of it. But you see, if it is, it comes from a lot of hubris and arrogance. Because if the assumption is we're going to threaten them with war and they'll back down, but what if they don't back down? If that's what it is, uh, an effort to get Russia to comply and allow Assad to be removed, that's what Washington is really demanding. It shows recklessness on the part of Washington. It shows that Washington most certainly is unfit to be a leader of uh, Europe because all of Europe is now exposed to this war that these idiots in Washington are mobilizing toward. And the Europeans all sit there, oh, good, the Americans will save us, blah, blah. I mean, it's mindless to me. I don't see any intelligence anywhere in the Western world. I'm talking about in the political leaders, the media. I just don't see it. Do you think that Russia really does, again, Russian government, really does perceive the recklessness of Washington? And I say that because in one of your articles, you say that the Russian government deceived itself with a a fantasy belief that Russia and Washington had a common cause in fighting ISIS. So, you know, if they're deceiving themselves, if that's true what you say, then that suggests that they're not really understanding what you call the recklessness of Washington. Well, they didn't. Uh, but they do now, I think. I mean, you know, Lavrov has said it's really pointless mm. negotiating with the Americans. They never keep the agreements. And now I think they see such extreme misrepresentations that they have to know diplomacy is useless. I think the Russians probably known this for a long time, but they are unwilling to uh, deny diplomatic efforts, because that means force confronts force. So they have replied to Washington's aggression with diplomacy. And I think they've done that in a very responsible way in order to avoid conflict. You know, they don't reply in kind. But I think now they see that that this sort of sensible policy on their part has simply been used by Washington in order to set them up further. Do you think in the past, well, up to this point, that they've been kind of calling Washington's bluff in the sense of, you know, Washington says it's all about removing ISIS. So has Russia been saying, okay, that's what it's about. So now join with us to fight ISIS. Let's kind of call your bluff on it. But now that's not going to work. I I don't think they were calling our bluff. I think they were actually hoping that um, the war on terror, Washington's war on terror was real and that it would lead to cooperation. Uh, between Washington and its European vassal states with Russia against the terrorists. And that this would then be uh, a development that would unify their interest and cool down the tensions. So I think that this was a very responsible and proper diplomatic policy for the Russians to take. I don't know if they understood all the risk of it, Uh, I don't know if they understood that the neoconservatives in Washington would see that as weakness on their part and push harder. I don't know if they understood the risk that Washington would simply take advantage of the Russians willing to keep giving these ceasefires in order to beef up ISIS and to interject American forces directly into the conflict and to arrange for Turkey to invade northern Syria. You see, I think the Russians and the Syrians can, at this point, clear out ISIS. Mm -hmm. Kerry's trying to block that in Aleppo, but the Russians and the Syrians can't really clear the Turks and the Americans out of northern Syria without having to attack Turkish and American forces. That then would lead to a much more serious situation. So... I don't know that the Russians understood that by giving these ceasefires and halting and all of this, that they were going to end up with direct American and NATO participation in Syria. So you say you're essentially saying they've been too trusting. And as a consequence of that, there's been this effectively an invasion. 
Is it 100 kilometers wide in northern Syria now occupied? Is that right? I don't know how large it is, but it would certainly mm. get larger. I mean, the country's petitioned, and so Washington can now keep the war going forever. In fact, it now has a place that ISIS can be safe because the Russians will hesitate to attack Turkish or U.S. positions. Now, they may simply lose their patience at some point. So, yes, I think they've been too trusting. But even more than that, I'm not sure they understood the risk in their very responsible position. They were trying to behave in a responsible way, and I don't think they understood that Washington was going to behave in the most irresponsible way possible. And so the two strategies don't meld in any way. So Washington's irresponsible policy would take advantage of the Russians' responsible policy. And I think the consequence has been worse for the Russians. If you remember two days after the 70th anniversary of the UN, in which Putin declared that the state of affairs in the world is no longer acceptable to Russia. The Russians went in to Syria and started wiping out ISIS. They had the job practically done, but they pulled out. And they went in legally, didn't they? They were invited in by Assad. They went in legally, yeah. But when they pulled out, I think this was, there are two explanations, and they may both have been part of it. Part of it was to show... Um, the Europeans, look, we're responsible. We're not trying to make Syria a territory, a part of our empire. And I think also the Russian government is handicapped by pro-Western elements. They're known as Atlanticist integrationists, and they believe that the future of Russia is to be integrated into the Western world. They're very Western-oriented. And I think that prime minister, the former president, uh, Medvedev, he, I think he's one of them. But they hold certain positions, and it seems that Putin kind of balances them with the more hard cast characters who are tired of putting up with the United States and the West. And so I think that's a constraint also on Putin's decision making. I think these Atlanticist integrationists, they are the most deluded people, and they probably. Uh, exercise a lot of pressure toward trusting uh, the West, which I think a number of the Russian government officials know is pointless. And I think when Lavrov more or less said that, it shows a change in temperature in Russia. Now, on the other hand, I'm convinced the Russians don't want a war. So whether they will give up, sacrifice something, in order to avoid war, that remains to be seen. But I think it's very irresponsible for Washington, the British, the Germans, the French, the Canadians, the Australians, the Danish. Can you imagine tiny little Denmark getting involved in something like this? I mean, they could be wiped off Earth in 10 seconds. When you see these people behave so irresponsibly in provoking a major military power armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons, you have to wonder if there is any intelligence anywhere in the Western world that can affect anything. Mm-hmm. Certainly not the media, certainly not in the governments, apparently not even in the big organizations. So when you have this type of situation, you have to say war is very possible. And one thing that really concerns me about this is as NATO troops get more and more involved, as surely they will do, and this area that's been invaded expands further, then it seems to me, I don't know whether you agree, that you know the mainstream media will make a propaganda coup out of this and say that, well, you know, Russia is not being involved in fighting terrorism anymore. They're not joining with the international community. They're being very selfish and looking after their own concerns and looking after serious concerns. And the bigger this occupation becomes and the more NATO gets involved with it, it's going to create even a greater bifurcation than we already have. Exactly. You're right. That's exactly what is happening. That's Washington's strategy. Mm. I use the word, uh, the phrase, international community there, (laughs) ironically, (laughs) because I know it's a propaganda phrase in itself. It's a propaganda. Chomsky often points that out, yeah. Um, 
I wanted to ask you about the rebels and the terrorists, as they're variously labelled. You also write uh, the Russian government even went along with the pretense that the various ISIS groups operating under various pen names were moderate rebels who could be separated from the extremists. So are you saying here that there are no moderate rebels, or are you just saying it's very difficult to distinguish between who is who, you know, because there are so many different groups? There are not any. It's just a made-up thing that Washington was using. All the so-called rebels in Syria were sent there by Washington from Libya. These are the people Washington used to overthrow Gaddafi. Mm. Now, Washington's plans were for Washington to invade Syria, just as they invaded Afghanistan and Iraq. You may remember Obama had the red line. (laughs) And if Assad of Syria crossed the red line, the United States would invade. And the red line was use of chemical weapons against his own people. So we listened to this being set up. They set this up over the months, maybe even over the course of a year. We were told repeatedly that uh, the United States would invade if Assad used chemical weapons against his own people. Then he obliged. Isn't that nice of him? <laughs> Apparently. He didn't. He did. I mean, all the evidence is that yeah. this was a fake job. So when we got these weapons to go off, then we said, ah, he's crossed the red line. We're going to invade. And Obama talked to Cameron. He said, of course, we'll support you. And yeah. we were getting all ready to go. And two things happened. The British Parliament voted no. Hmm. British Parliament told Cameron we're not going to support any more American war crimes. Absolutely. It's one of the best things we've done, I have to say. It was unbelievable. Nobody expected it, uh, least of all Cameron and Washington. And then the other amazing thing that happened was the Russians told us no. They said, you're not going to do that. We'll handle it diplomatically. We'll take all the chemical weapons out of Syria. And so that stymied us. And when we were stymied, because we're determined to get rid of Assad at all costs. Then we poured in ISIS. You know, every time an ISIS arms depot is captured, it's full of American weapons. We sent them there and we said, oh, these are the moderate rebels fighting for democracy in Syria against the dictator who kills his own people. So this is the kind of propaganda we, we made up. And then because some elements of ISIS were really pretty brutal, cutting people's heads off and eating their hearts. And we then said, oh, we are all these other groups. So we have ISIS, we had al Nurso, and we have all these other groups. And they're all made up names. So there's not any such thing as moderate rebels, and there aren't any rebels trying to overthrow Assad. You have to remember, Assad's been elected twice, and the vast majority of the Syrians support him. And he's not a dictator. Uh, he, he was actually a, a London eye doctor called home when his father died to try to hold the situation together. He's a secular leader. And we're getting rid of secular leaders. I mean, Saddam Hussein was a secular leader. For all practical purposes, so was Gaddafi. But they had independent foreign policies. They weren't willing to be American puppets. And so the Washington's policy is to remove secular leaders so that the whole Middle East goes into chaos of sectarian conflict, the Shia and the Sunnis. And if the whole Middle East is in sectarian conflict, there's nobody to get in Israel's way. And this conflict, this jihadism can be spread into Iran and the same thing achieved there. And then it can be spread into the Muslim areas of the Russian Federation and into the Muslim province of China, a province that borders Kazakhstan. And so this is Washington's policy for destabilizing Iran, Russia, and China. And that's what's going on. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with fighting terrorism. We sponsor it. We create it. It's a tool that we use. 
Is, is it a, a continue more than a continuation, but really a morphing into something much more sinister? You know, of the policy back in the time of the Soviet Union when the Mujahideen was used in order to fight a proxy war. I mean, is it a morphing of that into something global? Well, it's morphing into something against Iran, Russia, and China. Mm. What are the countries that the United States doesn't really dominate their policy? It was Libya, it was Saddam Hussein, Iraq, it's Syria, it's Iran, it's China, it's Russia. Mm -hmm. It was maybe in some sense also Afghanistan. So what's happened to these countries that were not under Washington's thumb? They're being destroyed. And Iran is not off the radar. They're just off it until we work our way through Syria. I think Iran is on the list that Wesley Clark talked about several years ago and he said that he was told that it was U.S. neocon policy to go into X number of countries in X number of years. Yeah, I don't remember if it's on there or not, on on what he said, Mm. but it's certainly on the list. Mm. In fact, every country. In fact, now what you're going to see is Philippines is going to be on the list because the president of Philippines is apparently had enough with the United States and is talking about opening to Russia and China. You have to remember the Philippines were conquered by us. We took them away from the Spanish and we ruled them and we didn't treat them nice. And some years ago, they banned us from Subic Bay. And then they got into a fight with China and needed some support. So they let us come back to Subic Bay. And now they've got this president who seems to be willing to throw us out again. So that's a very dangerous situation for him. But look what happens to anybody who doesn't follow our rule. What was the woman's name who was president of Argentina? Christina. We got rid of her. We framed her up. She's out. Mm -hmm. The next one was uh, Rousseff in Brazil. Framed up, gone. We're about to get rid of the president of Venezuela, Ecuador, and Bolivia. Why? Because they are independent in their foreign policies. They criticize us legitimately criticizes. So the United States simply does not permit any country to conduct a foreign policy independently of Washington. And so I'm challenging you, your listeners, anybody, give me a list of countries with independent foreign policies. Right now, you've got Syria, Iran, China, and Russia, and North Korea. Who else? South Korea? Japan? Nope. Indonesia? Nope. We wiped them out some decades ago. Malaysia? No. India? Uh, Yeah, India maybe. I don't know what we've got in store for India. I think Washington is going to try to avoid that and just bypass it. If they can destabilize Russia and China, then India will surrender. I'd like to, if I may, take you back to those U.S. airstrikes on Syrian positions that you mentioned at the top of the interview. You obviously do not accept what John Kerry has said about it, that it was a terrible accident. Um, that They thought they were attacking ISIS forces. Finian Cunningham says he thinks it was done deliberately to trash the ceasefire, but he thinks that maybe Obama and Kerry naively possibly believe that the ceasefire could go ahead and that this, therefore, is done by the Pentagon and the CIA behind the Obama administration's back. Do you think that's possible? It could have been done behind their back. Yeah, they could have been sent back. But they've acquiesced in it, haven't they? Yeah. Uh, it's not like uh, the president and Kerry have said, hey, look, uh, this was done by these military idiots and we've disciplined them. Sure. They've simply acquiesced in the lies. Here's what I have to say. If the United States did that by accident, it proves the United States is militarily incompetent. It's more incompetent than some third world country because it was a known position of the Syrian army. And it wasn't just the United States. The British were involved, I think, certainly the Australians in little Denmark. So what in the world is Australia and Denmark doing in this? See, it's it's all providing cover for Washington. What were the British doing it for? But I suppose John Kerry would say, well, it's, it's better to be incompetent than evil. And he sort of pulled that line, hasn't he, with respect to Russia, saying to them, well, you know, at least we've owned up to our terrible accident. Well, you haven't owned up about your supposed attack on the humanitarian convoys, uh, getting political capital out of this. Yeah, well, of course, the Russians didn't attack the convoy, did they? No. Why would they do it? 
we can go back to the Malaysian airliner. What interest does Russia have in shooting down a Malaysian airliner? Zero, none. Mm. It wouldn't happen. So what interest do they have in destroying the aid convoy that they have sent through their territory and control points? They didn't want the damn aid convoy to go there. They would have stopped it. I do agree with you. It's, it's just that, you know, this is one of the reasons why I actually wanted to speak to you, because I was listening to the radio and I constantly, this is the BBC mostly I tend to listen to, and of course, time and time again was coming the message that, although we couldn't be absolutely sure, of course, that Russia had done it, but for one reason or other, the US is saying, oh, we have reason to believe that it's Russia. That's the most likely explanation. And I'm sitting there thinking... That seems to me to be the least likely explanation for the right. reasons you've just said. What could they possibly have to gain? All they have to gain is the dislike of the whole world for doing something so evil. It just seems ridiculous to me. Well, you know, all of this is so silly. When you talk about evil, what do you think the United States and Britain have done for the last 15 years? How many millions of Muslims have they slaughtered? How many millions have they dispossessed and brought to their own borders as refugees because they can't do anything about it? Your whole refugee problem is your own fault. You went over there and supported American war crimes. There have been millions murdered, wounded, maimed, millions displaced. Talking about evil. I mean, the West is the font of this evil. And all of this slaughter based on outrageous, transparent lies. And the British Prime Minister gets up and talks as if he's the salt of the earth. It's sickening. It's like the entire West has become a psychopathic glob, devouring everything in sight. And now it's about to devour itself if it gets a nuclear war going. I mean, we're sitting on the precipice. I mean, these damn bombs could start going off any minute. You can't demonize nuclear powers Convince them you're going to attack them and expect them not to do something. That's what we're doing. Yes. But you have said to me in the past, I'm agreeing with you here, that you know, by doing what we have been doing, we're putting them onto a high state of alert. And that in itself is incredibly dangerous because it means that somebody could do something inadvertently. Perhaps they misunderstand an order or something like that, and all hell could break loose. It can break loose just as an accident, Julian. Yes. All during the Cold War, mm. there were numerous cases of false alarms yeah. that missiles had been launched. But because the United States and the Soviets were working to defuse tensions, mm. both sides, when they would get an alarm, were suspicious of it because they thought the tensions didn't justify the attack. And fortunately, didn't push some button thinking it was a real attack. But when you have tensions at the level they are now, one false alarm can produce a button pushed because we've convinced them we're going to attack them. And the crazy neo neocons are convinced that the Russians are evil. So if we get a false alarm, the neocons are going to be screaming, push the button, push the button. So it's really dangerous now. You know, Julian, people say, oh, the Cold War started again. You hear this constantly from pundits. I wish the Cold War would come back because the Cold War was very carefully managed. Tensions were reduced. We've got the opposite of a Cold War. We've got tensions increased beyond any level they ever existed before. What do you say about this situation brings to mind James Douglas's book, JFK and the Unspeakable, where he talks about um, John Kennedy and Khrushchev being in secret communication in order to try and uh, restrain both of their military who are wanting to behave in a, right. in a heated way. But there isn't that now, is there? No. There isn't that understanding between leaders at all. No, there's not. And that's why Kennedy was killed, because the CIA and the Joint Chiefs thought he was soft on communism and he was selling out America behind their backs by talking to this Soviet commie. And we can't trust him. He'll sell out America. And this is why he was assassinated. Yes, it makes a very convincing case. Yeah, yep. yeah. Can I bring you back to, uh, you know, we were talking about various factions in Syria and to what extent they're real, imaginary, etc. One thing that keeps coming up in the news, and of course this has to do with, you know, the, the memes of good and evil and the like, this is the white helmets. They're always appealed to as being the epitome of good, and no doubt they do a lot of good, but nevertheless, they're constantly appealed to as having the on-the-ground information about what's happened. And of course, because they represent good, it's very hard psychologically for anybody to disagree with what they say. So my question to you is, 
I mean, Assad believes this. Do you also agree that the white helmets are being used politically in this way to mold people's minds around a particular narrative? Of course, that's their function. That's why they're there. Okay, well, that answers that one, certainly. Um, I wanted to ask you a few more things, actually, about the Assad interview, which you posted a link to on your site, uh, which I thought was actually very interesting. And I have to say he came across in that interview as a very reasonable man. I have heard him speak before. Nothing about the way he behaved made me think this person is insane or a monster, but that seems to be what we're required to believe in the mainstream media. He talks about barrel bombs. The Associated Press chat brought that up. And, uh, you know, he was saying basically that barrel bombs are a kind of propaganda meme in the media because basically a bomb is a bomb. Um, has he got a point there? Of course, yeah. Yeah, everything he said was a point And it was hard for me to tell whether the Associated Press uh, reporter was just completely brainwashed and asking these questions because of his own ignorance or whether he was asking the questions to let Assad show the falsity of the various charges. That's how it came across. It came across this guy as mm. really not making a fool of himself. He's suspicious of the propaganda and his giving Assad the chance by directly confronting him with all the lies to deal with it. And I thought it was an outstanding job by Assad. Imagine any Western leader being able to respond to such a collection of hostile questions with such a plume, such poise, such complete control of the conversation and the answers. I mean, Assad was never on the defensive for one word. That's true. Yeah, he was asked, as you say, some incredibly difficult questions. Loaded questions. Yeah, absolutely. Was he ordering the yeah. bombing of civilian targets, hospitals and the like? And uh, yeah. basically his answer was, well, that would be a foolish thing to do, wouldn't it? We'd put his own people against him. And I thought, well, yeah, again, you've got a point there. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> why would one do such a thing? I mean, this yeah. is the constant theme that comes to my mind when I'm hearing about Syria. Why would they do this? So, why would they but, do that? It, see, what we need to ask is the opposite kind of question. Why? is Washington and its European vassals telling us such blatantly obvious lies. Why? What is the purpose of all these false charges? It has to be to justify war. There's no other possible answer, is there? I agree. It must be to justify making motions towards war, but presumably in the hope that the other side will back down. I mean, I <laughs> That has to be, surely, in their mind. They can't actually want to have a thermonuclear war. That doesn't make sense to me either. Well, some of them do want it. Really? Some of them think you can win it. And this is why they got the American war doctrine changed. You know, we no longer have mutually assured destruction, use of nuclear weapons only in retaliation. They now, in our war doctrine, are pre first strike. And the Russians know that. They know we've changed the war doctrine to preemptive first strike. So when you make them feel threatened and you make them feel they're going to be attacked, they're not going to sit there. They're going to strike. So this is why the world is a thousand times more dangerous than it ever was during the Cold War. So we have to come back to the question that needs to be asked to the BBC, to British Prime Minister, to everybody. Why? Are you telling us these lies? Why are you creating conflict? What is the purpose? If we're so concerned about Assad, why aren't we concerned about the Saudis and all the persecutions they do and what they're doing in Yemen? People are being slaughtered. They've got all kinds of infrastructure destruction, hunger, thirst. Why isn't this an issue? Well, I presume the answer is because British arms manufacturers are making too much money out of it. Could be. Still, the question is, why are we being told lies about Russia, China, Iran, Assad? Why is there nobody cares about all the people dying in Yemen? But we're all upset about the few people who allegedly died in an attack on an aid convoy in Syria. Why? What's the difference? Well, the difference is... The Saudi attack on Yemen serves Washington's purpose, and all the attacks on Syria serve Washington's purpose. And if they can be spread into attacks on 
Russia and Iran. That serves Washington's purpose. You know, if Washington succeeds in Syria, then first thing you're going to hear is see, well, look, it was so hard to succeed because Iran was supporting this brutal dictator. Assad, we have to get Iran. They have to be held accountable for this. And so then it'll all start there. And do you think it will be done in the same kind of way, by agitating within the country and same. sending people in to same. shoot into the crowd, etc., yeah. and getting everybody against each other, and then going in and saying, well, we've got a humanitarian crisis, etc.? Yes, we already have people there doing that. You know, there have been a lot of assassinations in Iran. You may remember, too, a few years back, we tried to pull the Green Revolution there. There was an election in which Washington money played a huge role, and we put out into the streets non-governmental organizations in Iran that we had been financing. And we had a candidate running. Uh, the whole West was in favor of him, and they announced the Green Revolution, and people were wearing green armbands, and this was all the American NGOs sent into operation. So Iran is vulnerable. I mean, it's already penetrated. And we have a lot of NGOs in Russia and China. Finally, the Russian government has made the foreign financed NGOs register and has declared them uh, unwelcome, but they're still there. We have them in China, particularly in Hong Kong. That's what all the student protests a couple of years ago in Hong Kong were about. We were trying to spread those into all the Chinese universities. But there's a tremendous amount of American money in China. American organizations, the Rockefeller Foundation's there, and we help finance universities and think tanks. So both of these countries are being trusting, thinking that having moved away from communism, that they had some sort of common interest with Washington. They don't perceive even now the ideology of the neoconservatives because the notion of world hegemony is so absurd that the Russians and Chinese can't take it seriously. They don't see that as a threat. It's just too absurd. What do you mean history chose you to have hegemony over the world? They don't understand that this is a real fanatical ideology. And so they've been careless in exposing themselves. Like the Russian currency is exposed. It can be manipulated. We can drive it down. They're foolish enough to allow foreign capital inflow. So you can send money in, drive the currency up, and then at the crucial point, you can pull it all out and drive the currency down. Their central bank president is so gullible, she doesn't even understand the exposure that she makes available, how Washington can control the Russian economy through her incompetence. Both of these countries are too open to their enemies. We have all kinds of money and organizations and the Rockefeller Foundation, everybody working to create allies. And in fact, I, I've, well, I won't say anymore. I was just thinking that when Russia acts in the way you described against these NGOs, getting them to register and the like, that is seen as Russia closing itself down and being dictatorial. Right. It's painted that's, in that, in that that's way. That's what they're accused of, yeah. In other words, if you don't let these crowds run through the streets and demand overthrow the government and all of that, and they are, they're all, they were all financed by Washington, in fact, the whole West, but mainly Washington and the German Marshall Fund. And there were a thousand, one thousand Western financed NGOs operating wow. in Russia. Right. Unregistered. Unregistered. I don't know how many are in China, but let me tell you what happens in China. An American company goes in, uh, has a plant there. It creates a domestic board, a regional board. Now, the company is run from the board in the U.S., but it creates a fake board and puts on there the relatives of the local and regional Communist Party officials, pays them enormous sums. This then corrupts the local and regional Communist Party officials and gives them an interest different from the central party officials. They become allied with the Western firms, paying their relatives enormous sums of money. This is the way Washington subverts countries. It's how we're subverting China. We do the same thing in the universities. The Chinese and Russian economists are essentially all neoliberals because they're trained in the Western tradition. So essentially, all of their recommendations set their countries up 
for manipulation by Washington. And a number of times in the interview, you have used the word uh, neoconservative. And in your article, you say that, you know, what's needed and needed quickly, and I'm going to quote from you is, um, the criminal neoconservatives must be immediately removed from power in Washington before the insane fools start World War Three. You say the CIA and the Pentagon must be put under tight constraints. And the European governments need immediately to disband the NATO alliance. So my question to you here is, well, how is any of that possible? It's not. That's why we're going to head right straight into World War III. Do you see... The people always say, tell us what to do. Well, I told them, that's what you've got to do if you want to avoid the war, and you can't do it. <laughs> yeah, but do you see any hope? And I'm, I'm not saying myself that I do, but I'm asking you if you see any hope with Donald Trump. And the reason why I say that is because you say that, well, you imply that his life is in danger. It's well known, obviously, that he is anti-establishment to an extent. The, the, the military establishment seems to hate his guts. Do you think there's any hope with him? Well, probably not. Um, if he were to be elected, the question is, could he staff a government that would support him? How would he do that? Does he know who those people are? Does he know who the enemies of the neoconservatives are? Does he know the people who don't believe in American world hegemony, who would conduct a different foreign policy? Uh, does he have people who would give up the reliance on coercion and force and retreat to diplomacy, to working things out the way Putin keeps offering? Does he know those people? No, he doesn't know who they are. He's not experienced in policy. He doesn't. Uh, his appointees have to be confirmed by the Senate, who are on lock, stock, and barrel by the oligarchs, by the military security complex, Wall Street, the big banks, the energy companies, agribusiness, the Israel lobby. So who can he appoint? And then if he gets a peacemaker or something, neocons will run to the Senate and say, oh, this guy is too weak. He won't stand up to Putin. And the Senate won't confirm him. You see, Trump has a lot of support because the American people obviously have lost confidence in the establishment. They've lost confidence in both parties. They rejected the party's candidates. All the Republican establishment candidates, they were wiped out by Trump, despite the media doing everything they could to destroy Trump. On the Democratic side, actually, Bernie Sanders won the nomination. It just wasn't given to him. It was stolen from him. So all those people know it was stolen from him. I doubt they're going to vote all of those Democrats. I doubt they're going to vote for Hillary. So if Trump doesn't win, it's because they've rigged the voting machines. They're all electronic. There are no paper trails. You can't tell how they're programmed because it's proprietary information. It's secret. So if Trump doesn't win, we'll know it was stolen if he does win, the question is, who staffs his government? How does he produce a government that will follow him rather than the powerful oligarchies? No, but isn't it possible that he could produce a kind of dysfunctional government? It sounds like a, a strange thing to hope for. But isn't it possible that it could be dysfunctional so that nothing can actually get done? Wouldn't that be a better situation than we have now? You told me earlier that Finney and Cunningham put forward the explanation, which is plausible that the CIA and the Pentagon decided to do one thing and not pay any attention to the president and the secretary of state. So how does Trump control that? Yeah. He doesn't. Um, I don't think the president of the United States was responsible for the Gulf of Tonkin mm. lie that we used to start the Vietnam War. I don't think the president was in on that. He was just sandbagged. Uh, they tried to sandbag John F. Kennedy with the Bay of Pigs. They produced a situation where they were convinced he would have to send in the American Air Force, and he didn't do it. So, you know, they do whatever they want to do, and you have to have a government. You, there are a couple hundred assistant secretaries, and of those, there's probably 30 that are very important. They got more power than the president. If he doesn't have those 30 assistant secretaries on his side, he doesn't have a government. 
Okay, so you can't think then of anything that is going to stop this continual neocon push towards no, the edge of war. You, you... Nothing can stop it with the Europeans. Mm. The European political parties have got to say, you know, the Americans, they've already ruined us with sanctions because we all of our firms and farmers and everybody have been hurt because can't do business with Russia. And now they're going to drag us into a war with Russia. What do we get out of that except death and destruction? And, yeah, we like all the bagfuls of money that the Americans give us, but you can't spend it if you're vaporized. And so to hell with NATO. We're not participating in this. No more U.S. bases in Europe. No more forward bases on Russia's borders. We don't want anything else to do with you. Go home. Because if we let you stay here, we're going to all be dead. D-E-A-D. And until the leaders in Europe can reach that conclusion, there's nothing can be done. Can you think of anything that will actually lead European leaders to that conclusion? I mean, the only thing I can think of from just from what you're saying people, now is some people, sort of... Pardon? People voting out all of the established candidates like the Americans tried to do in the primaries we've just went through. When the Tories and the Labour stand for election, they get zero votes. That's what has to happen. When Merkel stands for election, she gets zero votes. Hollande, Sarkozy, zero votes. Nothing else. Or else the Russians and the Chinese just have to surrender. Which is possible. I mean, it's, it's not Putin who's driving the world to the brink of conflict. He's sitting there taking all the insults and the affronts. He's not replying in kind. The Chinese raise their voice, but they don't take any threatening action. So they may say, well, look, you know, these crazy Americans are going to kill everybody. It's better to be a vassal than to be dead. They may. They may surrender. Well... As always, so often when we have these kinds of conversations, we do tend to end on a note which is obviously very concerning and uh, a bit of a downer. But one of the reasons why I do like speaking to you, Dr. Roberts, is you, you tell the truth as it is and you do not sweet talk it. Um, and I think listeners genuinely do appreciate that. Um, we are at this very, very dangerous juncture and there aren't many options, and you've described a couple of things that could happen, and we have to work towards that in any way that we can, and pray towards that in any way that we can, in the hope that these things will in fact happen that you have described. Otherwise, we're looking at, well, we're looking at destruction. Well, Julian, just keep in mind, it's really way too late to be getting concerned. We should have been concerned a long time ago. What was the matter with people? So we'll see what the Russians and the Chinese do, whether or not the world lives or dies, really, I think, will depend on whether or not they surrender. It won't depend on anything the West does, because the West has zero judgment, zero humanity, zero morality. But you said to me that you do have at least a modicum of hope that Europe will do the right thing at some point. Maybe it will require, I don't know, perhaps it will require a, a nuclear bomb going off somewhere and suddenly Europe saying, well, this is what's going to happen, right, we're pulling out of this situation. I don't know. But you do at least seem to hold out the hope that Europe will make a decision in the right direction, possibly. I think that's the only hope Putin has. That's why Putin takes all of this abuse. He's waiting on Europe to wake up. It's the only hope. Not that Europe can do anything, but if Europe removes itself from the American empire, we don't have the cover, we don't have the forward bases, we're isolated. And the evil here is so enormous, it must be isolated. Do you think there's anything short of some kind of no. localized nuclear strike that would actually wake the European people up? I don't know what the strike would be. I think if one of those things goes off, all of them are going to go off. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. You have to understand how destructive these are. People say, oh, well, nuclear war, it's not all that bad. Look, at here's Shima and Nagasaki. They're great, big, beautiful, enormous cities. Yeah. You know, they recovered. Uh, you know, it's no worse than the firebombing of Dresden. And this is the way 
some of these people talk. What they overlook is as powerful as the atomic bomb was. It's a pop gun compared to today's thermonuclear weapons. According to scientific studies, I have seen one Russian SS-18 warhead is capable of wiping out three-fourths of the state of New York for thousands of years. Three-fourths of the state of New York, thousands of years. So what, five or six of them down the east coast of the United States? There's no east coast of the United States. It's simply not there anymore. There's nothing there. And when they say, oh, they're usable, this is what the neocons say. Oh, they're usable. This is this idiot William Crystal. They're usable. What's the good of nuclear weapons if you can't use them? They're usable. And they're, they write these articles trying to convince people these weapons are usable. Perhaps they've at last created their own myth. They believe their own propaganda that they can create the truth. Isn't this a neocon idea? I think that's their idea, yeah. Everyone is lost in the matrix, including them. Mm. And so they, there's no turning back once these weapons go off. You can't go back and fix the situation. It's not fixable. You don't rebuild after these things go off. Therefore, when you create tension between powers that are armed like this, you are the most irresponsible, reckless person. And you certainly don't belong in public office. And yet that's the entirety of the United States government. Totally irresponsible, reckless, direct threat to all life on Earth. And people tolerate this. People need to understand the threat. There's no greater threat other than, you know, the sun going out or some huge comet hitting Earth and wiping it out. Indeed. This is an Armageddon scenario that you are... It's an Armageddon scenario that they have brewed up. And Washington pretends it's the light, it's the city on the hill, the light of mankind, the salt of the Earth, the lesson for everybody to follow. Again, Dr. Roberts, I do thank you for your willingness to come on the show and your honesty in speaking your mind. That is something that people, listeners, do cherish. I cherish it myself. It is a hard message to swallow, but, well, we have to swallow the truth. Otherwise, we're just living, as you say, in the matrix, and which is just self-delusion, which is ridiculous. Well, Julia, thanks for sharing your audience with me. I know that I sound extreme, but the situation's extreme. What am I supposed to do, pretend like it's not? No. No, absolutely. <laughs> There's no point in me pretending along with everybody else. No. So thanks for your interest and for what you do, and I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you ever so much, Dr. Roberts. It's a privilege. And I'm glad your electricity is back on at long last. Yeah, me too. You know, maybe that's what will save us. <laughs> yeah. Everything here just stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> They'll push the button and the power will have gone down. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm leaving that in. I'm leaving that in. That's, that's priceless. Yeah, use it. They'll push the button and there'll be a power outage. <laughs> because they spent all the money in the wars. I think I just, I do need to make listeners aware of the fact that when we were going to start this interview, that you had this power outage and we were perhaps going to try to connect by telephone, but that wasn't possible either. And we thought the interview wasn't going to happen. And uh, you say that your electricity situation is much worse than it used to be after all these uh, improvements in inverted commas that have gone on over the years. Yeah. So it's uh, highly amusing that you say that could actually end up saving us from all you've been talking about. <laughs> right. The U.S. infrastructure will simply collapse. <laughs> Maybe that'll save us. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Thank you Talk again, Dr. Roberts. Great to speak to you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.